chapter board. And uh, I'm gonna walk you through the agenda quickly so that you can know what is coming up and who's gonna be speaking when. Um, we do start off today with uh, a couple of our sponsors. Our sponsors today are uh, Jamin Hoops of Digital Guardian and Joe Rashke of Savient. And we are excited to have them be a part of our discussion today without our sponsors. Events like this might not be possible. So we really appreciate them. And the objective is for them to share some of their, um, their thought leadership around this discussion today. Our keynote is Michael Rasmussen, and he will be speaking on navigating chaos, managing risk in a cloud environment. We're very excited about that. And then our plan is to adjourn at 2.30. We are recording today's event and we'll be sending a link and making it available to all of our members early next week. Feel free to raise hands if anybody has any questions. Okay. <clears throat> Just quickly, we want to highlight some of our upcoming CSA partner events. Um, on the 15th, Jim Revis, Revis who's the co-founder and CEO at Cloud Security Alliance, is going to be presenting their Cloud Security uh, Alliance vision. And then we have two other events that are happening in October and November that involve our partner, RSA, that we're excited about. And they will be presenting a threat hunt, hunting labyrinth. I love that word. And uh, we have some more details about that that we'll present today. And then on the 10th, they will actually be conducting a threat hunting workshop. Um, and then on the, for 2021, we also have a number of things that are coming up. Um, in January, we will have a guest celebrity speaker. It's Brittany Kaiser. And she, uh, if you want more information about her, please look at the link that we have that's about Own Your Data Foundation. Um, she's phenomenal keynote speaker and she was a whistleblower. So there's a whole lot of, of additional content and uh, information about that that we'd like you to participate in. In February, we have the changing landscape of application development, and that's presented by Stone. The other thing we want to highlight is that in 2021, we're starting study groups in partnership with CSA that have to do with uh, a number of certificates that are available. And we would encourage you to take a look at those um, so that you can see what options are available to you and also to your teams and other people that you know that you might want to refer. Thank you. And then in terms of what's new, I'd like to hand this off to Rachel Stones, another member of our board. Hi, everybody. We have lots of new exciting things coming. Um, right now, obviously, we're in this weird environment where we feel more disconnected than ever. And because of this, we realized that we needed to pivot our content marketing strategy to keep us channels for these
working and partnering with Again, any support her, that would be wonderful.
highlight any of the the opportunity to be Dropbox, Google Drive, Box.com, et cetera. Those uh, also spiked, as you can see, one of the larger ones up 72%. So this is customers or uh, employees using personal uh, drives, in some cases not um, uh, corporate sanctioned Dropbox or Google Drives, uh, but any, any way to get that data out so that they could continue
and follow it up on. Many more endpoints than that under management, but the ones that we trended here, the, the virus total malware detections in, in the same time period by March were up 41%. Uh, phishing attempts were up 27%. Uh, and our investigations, our personal investigations were up 54%. And uh, a high fidelity threat notifications. This is when we, uh, after an investigation, we know something uh, suspicious or malicious is happening on the endpoints or in the environment. Uh, those were up 62%. And then finally, uh, we saw some new COVID-19 specific uh, phishing attempts and malware attempts. On this slide, I'm, I'm highlighting one of them. This is real th that uh, we caught at one of our environments. Uh, but some of the things I'm pointing out on the slide here, like the spoof sender, uh, the, the medical center uh, doesn't have like a .com or .org uh, you know, at the end of it. Uh, the atrocious grammar. Um, tends us to believe that as you're reading this, you might want to share this with your employees as a training exercise. If if the grammar is really bad, uh, you, that might be an indication that this there's some uh, phishing attempts going on here. Uh, you know, down, I, one thing I highlight down at the bottom where it says USA Volunteer Organization, there's not really a, a, a U.S. citizen that doesn't put USA in all capital letters, the, the U and then small SA, <clears throat> also are a, a red flag to our threat hunters. And then uh, there was an attachment, and that attachment, uh, excuse me, uh, you know, we downloaded that and, and ran that through our, our own detections, and, and there was a malicious document attached. Additionally, uh, you see we, we found some malware even labeled uh, UFI COVID19.exe in the bottom right hand corner there. Uh, run that through, if you run that through virus total, those hashes, you'll see uh, all the, the virus, antivirus vendors are saying um, that, it, you know, there's, there's malware associated. So there's definitely um, COVID19 related attacks. things you can do to allow your customer, your employees to access the cloud uh, to work on that data without having to pull it down 
and uh, email it to themselves or put it on USB drives that they leave on the bus and, and things like that. Um, Jamin, I think you have a few questions out there. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can pull up the chat window real quick. I, I saw some saw ahead. some people raising their hand too. Okay. Uh, we can. What types of industries are included in the report? I think we talked about that. Yep. How are you measuring hand washing with your tool? That's a good point. Uh, that, that that was a visual. Uh, we, we watched our we watched employees wash their hands. <laughs> uh, that, so that that was funny. Uh, was that all the questions out there? Okay, okay. Just to finish up, then um, host regular uh, security awareness training sessions. Uh, I've I've touched on that. Uh, just make sure as you find incidents that uh, you 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 break pieces of that out into trainings for your employees. Hey, this is something we saw. It was targeted uh, to our organization, and and this may happen to you. Please be aware. And and here's the steps you should take. Whether it's an email, a phone call, uh, whatever the case may be, but make them regular. Uh, and consider deploying virtual desktop or desktop as a service. The reason I have this on here is if, if your data is in your control environment, say, say you do want to move to a cloud environment and, and not have the data on employ employees homes and uh, USB drives and personal web mails, give them an environment where they can access that data without having to pull it down and work on it. Uh, and, and the VDI and desktop as a service are a couple of those environments that allow that. So uh, with that, uh, if there's any final questions, uh, if not, I'll turn the time back over to Jenny. Thank you. Thank you, Jamin. Um, and Thank you. a reminder to everyone who's participating today that if you have some questions, feel free to put your question in the meeting chat. We have people monitoring it, and we will find ways to respectfully interrupt the presenters so that they can respond to the questions. Jenny, Jenny, a couple quick questions before we move on um, sure. that were fielded. So, a couple they kind of tied together. Um, what are your recommendations to prevent exfiltrations to so many sources like this? And coincidentally, how would someone gain the same visibility for their organization? Yeah, so visibility first. There, there's tools that will scan uh, drives, uh, cloud drives, or or uh, employees' hard drives for sensitive information. And, and the sensitive information is user-definable, right? You can say, that I care about uh, these types of data, PII or HIPAA data or uh, PCI or ITAR, whatever the case may be. And, and, and it's customizable in a lot of these tools to uh, allow you to define uh, custom uh, sensitive information like your your patents, your secret sauce, uh, things like that. So uh, once it's identified, it's it's tagged, and and the tag lives with the files, uh, hopefully for for the life of that file. Uh, and then after it's tagged, uh, the, this mostly uh, the same tools, not all of them, uh, can take action on. Uh, preventing those files from moving to the wrong locations. So there are technologies, DLP vendors uh, are, are big into those type of data egress uh, monitoring, classification tagging, and uh, preventative actions as far as preventing data from going to the wrong places. Okay. Thank you, Jamin. Thank you. <coughs> Our next sponsor presenter is Joe Rashke, and he's from Savient. Joe, you want to <clears throat> present your deck? Great, we can see it. So you may need to unmute yourself. There I am. Ah, great. So I think I'm going to be building on a theme here from data protection to identity governance administration and then bridging into governance risks and compliance. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. There we go. Yeah, I think what we've seen, um, like those attack services, they're growing more. There's more persistent threats. 
more social engineering attacks, like we just pointed out. And there, now there's more regulatory control. And really, how do you scale when you start going to the cloud? How does that really work? And I think the chaos in the next presentation is really going to point that out. A little bit about myself. I've had a 30-year career in information technology. I came out of a CISO role. Before my CISO role in the manufacturing, I was at a consulting firm. I think at least one person on this call has has received like my draconian type security policies that I wrote 15, 20 years ago um, that have kind of evolved over time. So I got that kind of background. With it, I wanted to do a little bit of uh, polling as we go to make this a little bit more interactive. I think in the chat window, you can also, it's also in there at polyv.com. And I just want to check out some technology. I've got, just got two or or three different polling questions. And I would say, who has your vote? Let's see if the, the technology will work. And of course, I'm from Chicago, so you can always vote multiple times. I always vote for Herb. I'm gonna turn off my camera, because I'm getting some issues here. So it's starting to work. Got a few people voting. Give people one minute. A few votes for the wild. Some Vikings, some twins. A good amount for Mr. Herb Brooks. Okay, let's go on. Nice little representation. And the technology is working. Great. Okay. So when I took a look at things, it's really like, how do you do infrastructure, platform, and SaaS op opportunities? What's happening in our landscape between those different platforms? What are really these challenges? We keep seeing more continuous compliance requ requirements, access to visibility into the cloud, and then also how do you handle privileged usage as well? Um, I think from the last presentation, you really saw where did the data start flying? It started going everywhere. Um, how many times is that accountable to like security misconfigurations? And then you really start getting into that chaos of the serverless and container security nuances uh, and what's happening. Being From that, I always go back to can you have an approach of having three specific things? Can you get that visibility? Can you provide the compliance and prevention? Is it actionable? The second one in our organizations, can you really look through identity lifecycle management? And then third, what are you doing about privileged access management and privileged access governance in your solutions? Um, so then the next question I would say is from the theme of, of this month is GRC. What is GRC? Um, what I've seen is that depending on who you talk to, it's always a completely different conversation. Uh, some examples, enterprise risk management, Somebody's looking at application governance. Someone's looking at com com compliance management. And it really comes down to access controls and access management are key. Um, and then you start taking a look at it from a perspective as what's good enough and what kind of risk analysis do you actually do and can provide? Second question that we have in the poll, uh, how would you guys define your GRC approach in your organizations? And give everybody a minute here. Yeah, and everything is anonymous. A little bit of both. Great. Good. So you see a little bit of everything. Uh, it's which kind of a, I would expect to see. I'm going to move on. Yeah, what I've now really start seeing as a trend is really this convergence of identity management and GRC. Uh, there's internal controls, but then you've got segregation of duty issues inside of applications, but they really start going across multiple applications. And you still have to add the sensitive or critical access analysis. What's happening? You have the data that's moving. Who's actually doing the data movement and why? Can you actually talk to your employers or employees and really understand what that is? 
And if you look at a solution, the GRC world is really going beyond a given application and really building into that infrastructure and also that those cloud applications. And how do you really integrate that seamlessly across uh, the governance processes? Can you understand who's got access to what, when, and why and track it? I know from an auditing perspective, we always had issues with terminations, but a lot of times you never got to the maturity level to actually fix the problem upstream. And that's when we take a look at like the tr traditional approach to identity management. How do you actually just get application access? How do you do compliance? Are you following a certain set of policies? But should you? I think um, in years past, I would generate daily reports and certification reports. And I would think that 80% of what I've generated on a daily and weekly and quarterly basis were blank reports. So it really became something of a challenge to say, are we actually doing effective security? Are we doing effective identity management? And then how do you start taking a look at the bottom line, failed audit controls, but can you actually look at and understand as a combination between identity management and GRC capabilities? Now that you start taking a look at it from uh, focused on specific ERPs, we've got SAP GRC, we've got Oracle GRC, we've got workday issues related to that, but you really don't get a whole complete picture when you're only looking at a single application GRC model with that. You don't get the visibility. Um, and a lot of times people are still worried about the fundamentals of trying to just provision and birthright rules that joiners, movers, and leavers actually can get access to their systems, and you're not looking back in, in arrears to say, how many people are actually over-provisioned, have too much information, and have too much access? And I think a lot, a lot of the legacy programs were built on that automation for specific controls, but as you're layering in CCPA, GDPR, more global requirements, you really see people struggle with, how do you see this whole picture and do I understand it from a risk perspective more so than governance or compliance? Uh, so one more question, quick one here. Uh, what gaps um, do you see in the, your current approach to GRC? Do you see it too focused on applications, uh, too focused on policies? What would be the gap that you guys see? policies, coherent view, focus policies. Okay, here we go. Defining GRC, policies over narrow, great. Over broad, either focused, great. Great, kind of what we see across the board. Let's see if I advance on. Yeah, coarse grain, another topic that we'll get into a little bit more. I'll go through this pretty quickly. Coarse grain, do you have a role in your organization? You're an a, your accounts payable, your accounts receivable, different roles. But what really happens underneath the scenes at that fine grain level is what can you do with that? I think a lot of that times from a GRC perspective, you've got it at a very coarse grain level or not necessarily a fine grain level. You're just provisioning to somebody inside of SharePoint, uh, Microsoft 365, instead of Microsoft Teams. But what does it really mean inside those applications? Don't really get checked until you start getting to that fine grained security analysis. And then you start converging. And this is where I think over the next five years, you'll see a much bigger picture of how do you do IGA and GRC? Um, how do you really do those SOD checks and those risks inside of the governance process? Can you create an account and create a vendor? Can you do those? Can you also export data to a SharePoint folder? And maybe you shouldn't. How do we pick that up? How do you do that before your provisioning or after your provisioning? Can you figure out those checks in advance? How do you expand it across a complete solution, not siloed into a given policy for a given application? Third area that I've really seen consistently is 
how do you do that SOD management? How do I have a single control platform for all the controls across your applications and your infrastructure? And the fourth item, how do you really move to some kind of continuous control monitoring? Uh, same thing with data, same thing with uh, ERP and GRC controls. Really, how do you take a look at those analytical controls to make sure that that's working properly? Big challenge, how do you stay compliant? That's one of the items, we could stay compliant for a three to six month period, but inevitably beyond that, we were not able to do it. That you would do it once and every six months, you'd have the same challenges with how can we keep over provisioning? Uh, who are the DBAs? Who are the uh, domain admins? Who has excessive rights inside that application from a GRC perspective? And how do you actually start fixing the problem instead of just reporting on it? Um, when we start getting into the cloud world, and you'll see more of this, is are you monitoring this, not only that management console and that front door of how people access those applications, but can you really see from a command line? Can you take a look at all the instances of containers, serverless code that now goes into our solutions? What about cloud databases, API control? And then the one that always kind of gets left behind uh, from a security perspective is what's happening with the DevOps tools that are not online all the time, but sporadically come up. Where do you start tracking the identities of people that get access to all of that data and those systems? Yep. And then the last, the last question I've gotten, and I just got one more, a couple slides after this, would be what technologies have been problematic from a cloud security perspective? AWS. Yeah, let really take a look at when we're taking a look at governance, risk, compliance, merging with identity governance administration of the administration or the audit or the authentication or authorization. What really happens? What has been problematic in your worlds? Yeah, I kind of feel like uh, Ed McMahon teeing up uh, Johnny Carson on this one. Pipelines, IOT. Yeah, with IOT, we did a lot of work with IOT in the past. Um, there is no real security, just trying to wall them off as much as possible. Where it was all about availability, not as much about confidentiality or integrity. The systems had to keep running. Okay, that's a good start. And then we talk a look about a couple more challenges with cloud that we've seen. Um, at the enterprise level, joiners, movers, leavers talked about this. How do you really have a disjointed enterprise and cloud process between the users or privileges and the services between Amazon, Azure, GCP? Uh, a lot of times we have a cloud first or a cloud native approach now. How do you really handle that across those joiners, movers, and leavers? And then especially after they move, how do you start really getting that visibility from a governance and compliance standpoint. Uh, I think the GCP server from the years past, before you'd have a server for five or six years, maybe three years, maybe 18 months. Uh, about 18 months ago, GCP said the average length of a server was 32 minutes. How do I audit that? How do I secure that? How do I actually tell what happened when it was up for the 12 minutes it was running? Yeah, we talk about um, when, do you remove people's privileges in, in that world? How many is it? 63% of those organizations remove the privileged access after 24 hours, not before the 24 hours. And then the other one is really, how do you converge provisioning and administration of identity and governance into PAM, into a sing, single platform, privileged access management, um, privileged account management, how do you really take a look at that? What do you need to do with joiners, movers, and leaders? So there are a lot of challenges that we're going through, and over the next few years, you really see this IGA melding with GRC capabilities in the in the marketplace. I kind of go from a business perspective to kind of summarize. Uh, people are really looking for disruptive issues, situations and applications. What's really cloud native? What's as a service? 
people are looking for IGA, GRC, and privileged account management as a service uh, together. They, they no longer can ha keep having tens and 20 different security tools do all individual functionality. How does that really come together over the next few years? And then how do you really put risk and governance at the front of the cloud instead of tacking on security in arrears? So a lot of challenges that we've kind of taken a look at and ready to move on. But I really think that IGA and that GRC world are merging at this point over the next few years as a trend. And with that, that's it. That's my quick little IGA and GRC presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, our next speaker is our keynote speaker, and it's Michael Rasmussen, and he's internationally recognized. Uh, he has about 27 plus years of experience helping organizations improve their, their governance, risk management, and compliance stat, stance. Um, he's often referred to as the father of GRC, as he was the first to define and model the GRC market in 2002, I believe. So, um, Michael, I would invite you to show your presentation and we can get going. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Oh, excellent. Well, it is a pleasure to be here today. I look forward to spending the, the next, oh, we'll about have half hour left on, uh, you know, this discussing, you know, GRC and this concept of integrated risk and being able to manage risk in cloud environments, uh, what I call navigating chaos. Um, as referenced, uh, uh, I'm Michael Rasmussen. Um, I've got 27 years of experience in this space. The 90s was focused specifically on information risk and compliance. I started Milwaukee chapter of the ISSA and was on the international board of the ISSA for several years and just got back on the international board of the ISSA this past summer, just now. Uh, so stepping on to the new term on that in just a couple of weeks. Um, you know, spent seven years at Forrester Research, where I was one of their top analysts. And as referenced, you know, I guess my claim to fame is in February 2002, I defined and modeled a market for technology and labeled a GRC and uh, left to Forrester in 2007 and been 13 years as an independent research analyst. Uh, so my job is research. I, my, I research, you know, the struggles and challenges that are keeping companies at night in context of governance, risk, and compliance, and how they go about solving that with strategy, process, and technology. Uh, in that perspective, you know, as we, the term GRC has already been brought up in the previous pre, um, presentations, from my perspective, everybody's doing GRC today, whether they use that term or not, you know, whether, whether it's GRC or ERM or for bid Gartner's IRM, which I have some issues with, but uh, um, you know, everybody's doing some form of governance, risk, and compliance. Uh, the official definition of GRC that's found in the OSEC GRC capability model that I helped contribute to is that GRC is a capability to reliably achieve objectives. You know, that's the governance function. Uh, and then objectives can be, you know, overall strategic entity level objectives. They can be division, department, process, asset, or even project level objectives. Uh, and address uncertainty, you know, that's risk management. And ISO 31000 says that risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives and active integrity, that's the compliance. So the official definition of GRC is that GRC is a capability to reliably achieve objectives while addressing uncertainty and active integrity. So let's apply that to the modern environment and including the cloud environment. I wrote a paper that was published last October in Enterprise Risk Magazine by the Institute of Risk Management in London, uh, particularly on this topic. And, and, and I can forward that to anybody that, that'd like to see that, but it was called Navigating Chaos. And, and you have to step back and realize that this was last October, so this is before COVID-19. And, and, and I made the claim that, you know, business is dynamic, it's distributed, it's disrupted. It's changing minute by minute and second by second. Therefore, organizations need to have an integrated view of risk and compliance controls across their environment because we live in an interconnected risk environment. What starts off with a risk in one area has this cascading of impact in other areas. Look at us now with COVID-19. You know, at its heart, COVID-19 is a health and safety risk. Um, and, 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 and so that, that's where it starts, but it has this downstream impact. It, it has a significant IT risks as 
you know, with, with the world shutting down and going to lockdowns and things, we saw increased activity in, in, in hacker act, um, activity and, and, and scams and things like that. Uh, we also pushed and saw, you know, greater, um, you know, uh, focus on home office workers. Um, and in that context, a greater focus on IT security in the home office. <laughs> and, and, and particularly exposure to things like Internet of Things. And, uh, you know, my, my TV behind me is connected to the Internet. You know, my light switches are connected to the Internet. You know, my blender down in the kitchen is connected to the Internet. You know, uh, with the Internet of Things, you know, some exposure uh, with that, uh, you know, blender, for example, a Trojan horse or vulnerability could expose my home office network. Um, and therefore, uh, data on my clients or access to clients and things, and, and that's significant. Uh, you know, th there's greater uh, push because of COVID-19 to put more and more reliability on cloud services and things. But then there's been also issues with some service providers and things with uh, particularly things run in, in certain uh, parts of the world uh, where, you know, whole places have gone down because uh, they've been in lockdowns too. And, and so you have this cascading impact of risk. I can go on and how it's increased bribery and corruption risk, harassment, discrimination risk, and, and all these different areas. It's an interconnected risk environment. And so today, you know, I'm, I'm trying to talk and point a picture and how do we place cloud risk in the context of enterprise risk in GRC? Uh, and how do we have those business conversations with other executives as we rely on the cloud more and more for business and how do we understand the, the risk exposure not just to the cloud and data itself but to reliable business processes and data that comes with that it's navigating chaos in fact we have the, the challenge what we call chaos theory with chaos theory you have the flutter of the butterfly's wings in the netherlands that makes tiny atmospheric changes that has this growing and cascading impact that can influence the development and path of a hurricane in the gulf of mexico who knows, some of these hurricanes we've just seen come through the Gulf of Mexico, you know, could have started with the flutter of a butterfly's wings in the Netherlands. The little things matter, you know, COVID-19, you know, that health and safety risk cascades into a worldwide pandemic and lockdowns. You know, the, uh, something small can shut down the business, can shut down the cloud operations. Leonardo da Vinci said, realize that we, everything connects to everything else. We have to see the interconnectedness of risk. The challenge in organizations today is that we manage things in so much isolation, you know, where IT security is doing its piece of the puzzle and, and, and enterprise risk management has its piece of the puzzle. Corporate compliance and ethics has its piece of the puzzle. And very few people are connecting these dots and seeing the big picture of risk. The physicist Fridjof Capra stated, the more we study the major problems of our time, the more we come to realize that they are systemic problems, which means that they are interconnected and interdependent. We cannot just measure cloud risk within its own little bubble. We've got to understand cloud risk on the risk of objectives to business processes, uh, on the risk of, obje uh, of, ob of objectives and security of individual data, uh, of you know, the risk if there's failings in cloud security to overall business objectives across the organization, strategic objectives, revenue objectives. You know, it's an integrated risk environment and we need to see all these different threads of risk and how they come together and impact and interconnect with each other. And so cloud risk has an impact on a lot of other risks in the organization, strategic risks to objectives and finance, uh, reliable business processes. We're seeing a, a lot of focus on operational resiliency and, 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 and cloud computing can bring us greater resilient organizations, but done improperly, they, it can significantly hurt resiliency in the organization as well. And we have to be able to see this interconnectedness of risk, which becomes critical in today's modern organization. Think about it. You know, the greatest challenge impacting your organizations is change volumes of legal and regulatory change that could impact cloud processes, cloud data, and, and overall security systems. Uh, you know, global financial services firms, just as one example data point, global firms are dealing with 217 regulatory change events every business day, coming, coming from over 1,000 regulators around the world. That's just financial services. Other industries have other regulations. You know, but you know, right now on average, 217 regulatory change events every business day in financial services. It could be a new law or regulation, a change law, an enforcement, some regulatory guidance and things. And we have to keep up on that because a lot of those changes impact the cloud computing environment, the data environment. Uh, when there's enforcement actions and things like that, we need to look at, you know, what did the regulator and courts look like at, at when there was that enforcement action? How does that impact our own security posture and processes? 
We've got changes to our external risk environment, shifts in market forces and geopolitical risks and import export and everything else and competitive in society and shifts in technology. And we have to keep up with risk change. So we have to keep up with both regulatory change and risk change. But then we have to keep up with the change in the internal business, shifts in strategy, shifts in processes as they rely more and more on cloud computing, you know, shifts in employees and responsibilities and roles and third party relationships. I've been talking to one global automobile manufacturer, you know, and, and they've come to the realization that, wow, you know, we've got all these different, you know, processes that are being outsourced and we're leveraging cloud computing in so many areas. What used to be more of an internal risk to this global automobile manufacturer transcends and goes across a, a lot of third party relationships. And how do we manage that? And furthermore, you have all the challenges of mergers and acquisitions. You know, when you acquire another firm or merge, there's completely redundant sets of processes, uh, cloud computing and things being caught in the crosshairs of those processes, what's being kept, what's being scrapped, what's the which ones are, are the most secure and, and strongest and most reliable services for the organization. And we have to keep all of this change in sync, the volume of legal and regulatory change, the risk change and the business change. You can be like some organizations that devote, you know, an army of lawyers to keep up with regulatory change, but that doesn't keep you compliant and, and, and doesn't keep you with, you know, the controls there to mitigate risk. If the business has changed and you're not compliant anymore and the controls aren't there, you have to keep all this change in sync. So the legal and regulatory change, the risk change and business change to be able to properly manage and address governance, risk and compliance. And so when it comes to cloud risk pressures, you have uh, a lot of challenges before you. Things like privacy, you know, GDPR, CCPA, um, it, it, every day where it's bearing down on us. Uh, um, you got PCI DSS, you know, vulnerabilities and threats, and the issues of you know, client data and intellectual property, uh, other regulations like New York DFS and, and so forth. And um, you got dis, uh, disaster recovery and operational resiliency issues. Uh, great, uh, you know, the impact on IT operations and project and the reputation and brand should things fail and, you know, reliable service delivery, particularly in the IT department. There's lots of different types of cloud risk exposure, even to the reputation and brand and media coverage and things if things fail. And we have to be able to keep all this in perspective. From there, the organization needs to be able to see the tree as well as the forest, you know. So the, the point here is, is that, you know, we have the interconnectedness of risk in the forest as well as the individual tree, that individual risk uh, area. Uh, and I present this slide a lot in, in my workshops when, when there's no COVID-19 and I can do workshops around the world. Uh, and, and I've actually been challenged on this slide twice, once in uh, um, San Francisco and the other time in London. And both, you know, had in both cases, it was a global bank, a different global bank in each one. So two different global banks said the exact same thing. They said, this is a great slide, but it's not quite reality. Uh, the, the challenge in our organization is we need to be able to see the leaf as it connects to the branch and the branch as it connects to the tree and the trees as part of a forest. You know, one example given is, is that if the risk is a third party vendor relationship or supplier or a cloud provider, you know, that's great, but we've got to get down to the leaf some branch in that relationship with that cloud provider and understand that, you know, the identity and access risk that was just brought up in, before us in, in the previous conversation, uh, um, the previous presenter. Well, if it's a outsourcing and service provider relationship, you know, maybe we're uh, relying on a global, you know, outsourcer and we have 100 different contracts or service level agreements with them. We need to understand that 89 of them touch GDPR information and 11 do not. And, and so the reality is it's not just the tree in the forest, even though it's a great analogy, it gets down to the leaves and the branches. And we've got to get down to the details of the risks, the vulnerabilities and threats within the cloud environment, as well as in other uh, third party relationships and things with outsourcers and service providers and contractors and consultants and more, and be able to see this big perspective and the interconnectedness of risk as it all comes together to bring the forest of risk. But unfortunately, the way a lot of organizations go, on, uh, go about managing security and risk and compliance and internal controls is what I call the, call the inevitability of failure. You know, and, and this actually, go, the, the, that term I love because it actually goes back to the 1990s uh, from a NIST report called the Ine Ine Inevitability of Failure, the Flawed Assumption of uh, Security in Modern Computing Systems. And, and uh, I, I grasped onto that term, the inevitability of failure, to talk a lot about it in a lot of different ways. Um, 
Uh, but, you know, we have the multi-headed dragon, the Hydra, that Hercules had to fight. You cut off one of its heads and multiple heads grows up in its place, creating more threats and issues than were there to begin with. Trying to manage security, risk and compliance and things and documents, spreadsheets and emails and manual processes is a recipe for disaster. I was talking to one firm that was spending 200 employee hours to build a report for the board of directors once a year. It now takes them less than a minute, but before it's taking them 200 hours. And then they came to realize after they built this report that took 200 hours to build once a year, that 11 months ago they started to have this risk issue. Now it's grown and ballooned out of control and has become a big issue. I was, talk, I was working on an RFP for a mid-size uh, bank. Um, oh, this is about two years ago. And, and they did an internal evaluation of their internal staff and found that 80% of their security, compliance, and internal control resources was nothing more than document reconcilers trying to manage hundreds to thousands of documents, spreadsheets, and emails and report on it. You know, that's not managing risk and compliance today. That's reacting to risk and compliance. It's the inevitability of failure. And more and more, we're seeing the auditors, uh, the regulators, uh, um, law enforcement, opposing counsel and lawsuits. They want to know what was assessed on what date and time, who assessed it. Is there some type of strong system of record and audit trail to be able to back up that information and provide evidence there? Documents, spreadsheets and emails by themselves don't get you there. So we're moving towards a past uh, of reactive manual processes that are very labor intensive to a future of greater automation, um, more greater accountability and structures for risk oversight, even at a senior management function level. Uh, and, and with that, you know, greater understanding and visibility into the integrated nature of risk uh, throughout the business, uh, to, and particularly from cloud environments and its impact on business processes, operations and objectives needs to be understood, particularly in that context of objectives themselves. In some areas of the world, we're seeing actually, you know, greater accountability uh, from a financial perspective put on senior management functions. Not here in the U.S. right now, but, uh, you know, the United Kingdom with the SMCR, Senior Managers and Certification Regime, Ireland's SEER regulation, Australia's BEAR regulation, Hong Kong's Managers in Charge regulation, you know, actually puts you know, res financial responsibility on senior management functions for risk and compliance failures. That if, if there's lack of due diligence or negligence in risk and compliance and controls, those senior management functions could, if there's willful wrongdoing, go to jail for seven years or can be personally fined. You know, Barclays CEO was fined 640,000 pounds, so nearly a million US dollars uh, for a compliance issue that he personally had to pay out of his bank account because of UK SMCR. So some of this future is that we're also seeing greater accountability uh, for risk compliance controls in certain parts of the world as well. So let, let I, early on, I defined, you know, GRC. And again, let me redefine that. Now, GRC is a capability that enables an organization to reliably achieve objectives, that's the governance function, while addressing uncertainty, that's risk management, and active integrity, that's the compliance piece. Now, let's adapt this for cloud risk management. I say that cloud risk management is a capability that enables an organization to reliably achieve objectives while addressing uncertainty and active integrity in and across its cloud environments. So to me, there's aspects of GR and C and proper cloud risk management. We are engaging those cloud vendors for a purpose. There's objectives in every cloud relationship we have. And what are the objectives, the, the process level objectives, the strategic business objectives for why we form that relationship with that cloud vendor? And so we need to govern these relationships to ensure that we are reliably achieving the objectives and the very purpose why we have that cloud relationship to begin with and are using that cloud computing. So we govern those. We also have to manage the uncertainty, the risk exposure in those relationships and in, in, in the cloud environment and the active integrity, meaning our compliance obligations and the controls and things that are in place to meet those, whether they're uh, regulatory obligations or, or just you know the, the security practices and controls of the organization itself. So cloud risk management is a capability that enables an organization to reliably achieve objectives while addressing uncertainty and active integrity in and across its cloud environment. This means that to properly do this, we have to have an integrated view of the um, different roles responsible for risk management that can relate to the cloud. So th this includes, you know, the, the security team, you know, that, that's directly involved with cloud security. 
It, it can include the procurement and contracting team. It, it can definitely involve the privacy team, particularly when things of personal data are involved, like uh, things regulated by GDPR and CCPA. It can involve corporate compliance and ethics and legal. Uh, it can involve business continuity and resiliency. Um, it can also involve enterprise and operational risk, as well as the business itself. And so we need to have greater collaboration in our cloud security strategy because, as I stated a few minutes ago, it's that interconnected risk environment navigating chaos. And, it's, and cloud security cannot just operate in its own little silo in isolation. You need to be able to see across these different areas, and cloud security should have, be able to have objective conversations with other elements of the business on the risk exposure and how that's going to either help or hinder the objectives of the organization uh, as we execute on, on strategy and rely on cloud computing to achieve that strategy. It means that organizations have to have a top-down approach. What is our cloud management strategy? How do we go about managing cl the, the cloud uh, and, and the security in the cloud environment? What are the different processes for going out and managing threats and vulnerabilities and, and making sure controls are in place, performing the audits and inspections and gathering assessment information from cloud providers? Uh, that becomes critical. And then what's the overall information technology environment that can support the overall cloud management strategy and processes? We need to clearly understand you know, a top-down view of cloud risk and how the cloud computing environment impacts strategic risk of the organization as it aims to reliably achieve the objectives, as well as a bottoms up in the view weeds of cloud risk from the vulnerabilities and exposure, you know, the operational risk aspects of the cloud. And when you look at cloud computing, it impacts both. You can have the operational impacts of the cloud from a vulnerability or exposure, downtime, data breaches, and things like that. Um, but that it can also impact the top level view of if we have some type of significant cloud issue, how is it going to hinder us from reliably achieving those business or process or department level objectives? It means we need to have this integrated cloud risk information architecture where we can define what are the process or asset um, and as well as strategic level objectives uh, that are that are involved for supporting the, this cloud operation. You know, what are the risks to achieving those objectives? What are the controls that we put in place to reliably achieve the objectives in that process we're outsourcing to the cloud or that data that's out there? What are the controls that are in place to mitigate that risk exposure to where it's a, uh, an acceptable level? Uh, understand that when you have a risk, you have four things you can do with the risk. You can accept the risk as it is. You can avoid the risk if possible by making a decision where there's no longer a risk. You can transfer the risk like through hedging and insurance. <clears throat> or you can mitigate the risk, which you focus on the most often by implementing controls where we, we move that risk from the inherent risk to an acceptable residual risk. What are the, what's the history of issues, incidents, um, and events where this risk is materialized and does it point to <clears throat> issues in the control environment? What are the roles? Who owns that cloud process and, and that cloud relationship? Who's the subject matter expert on various risks? <coughs> what policies are in place? From like vendor code of conduct that impacts the cloud computing provider to the security policies and procedures in that cloud. Uh, I mean, stepping back, you know, just from cloud and talking about broader outsourcing relationships, I've been interacting with one global European bank. They're looking at having everybody in their data centers. Now, well, let's just pause right there. Global banks data centers. Who is in a global bank's data centers? Most of the people in this global bank's data center are not employees. They are third parties. They are outsourcers, service providers, contractors, consultants. Now, they're requiring everybody in their data centers to go through the same security policies and training that their employees do, particularly on GDPR. You know, that's something to consider. You know, how are we communicating our policies and requiring similar policies within our cloud environments and other outsourcing and service provider relationships? What are the regulatory obligations that impact that cloud provider and the data that they're housing and processes that they're involved in? And who owns that relationship in the overall entity? We need this integrated information architecture to adequately see the visibility into cloud risk and be able to report on that in the organization. It means we need to be able to take in a lot of distributed and disconnected data points in the organization, understand these and map them together contextually so that we understand vulnerabilities and threats and exposures um, 
out there in the cloud environment, analyze access as well as it was brought up in the presentation before us, you know, identity access is a critical element here. Analyze and understand relationships and take action on those. So in conclusion, we need an agile approach to managing cloud risk. Cloud risk management being that capability to reliably achieve objectives and address uncertainty and active integrity in our cloud environment. Uh, risk isn't just about the threats, hazards, and harm, but it's also about reliably achieving the objectives. That's a critical piece of that. We want to probably govern these relationships to ensure that they're achieving the objectives that we actually set out for in the relationship itself. So agile cloud risk means that we're going to collaborate with other roles and departments and functions, including continuity and resiliency, uh, privacy, of course, IT security, um, you know, corporate compliance and legal and procurement and other roles that are involved in cloud computing and, and third party relationships be more so that we can become more aware of our risk and how it interconnects. That way we can align our resources and understand the risk exposure and the objectives of the relationship so we can become more responsive to issues and contain them while they're still small issues before they become big issues. That we, we can be more agile as I started off with, you know, with changing laws and regulations, changing risks and changing business processes and technology, we need to keep be very agile in a very dynamic environment, which also means that we need to aim for resiliency, you know, that our cloud risk processes are reliable uh, and that we're highly resilient, particularly in this world of chaos that we live in now, but be able to achieve all this in a way that is efficient in our use of human and financial capital resources. So I was able to get through this uh, and leave about five minutes because I think we end here at 2.30 um, for Q&A time and, and any final discussion. Thank you, Michael. Are there any um, questions for Michael regarding his presentation <clears throat> and the information? So it looks like there is a question out there that says, uh, what are the key elements and best practices for building a business case for a cloud risk management team? When I look at helping companies with a business case for GRC broadly or specifically areas like cloud risk, I, I try to focus on three elements. One element is efficiency. What's it costing me today in time and money and implementing this new strategy with proper technology and things, what, what's the difference there? You know, before it took me 200 hours to build this, you know, compliance security report. Now it can be there in, at the press of a button or let's say five minutes, you know, and you can start to, you're calculating efficiency within human financial and uh, human capital, uh, human capital and, and financial efficiency. Uh, so efficiency is one angle. The other angle for a business case is effectiveness greater security, greater, um, um, less vulnerability and exposure, reduced risk, um, you know, all those type of elements, greater accuracy and reliability of information. Um, and then the third angle is agility. You know, how is this going to help us keep up with a very dynamic and changing technology, business process, and regulatory and risk environment? So the three angles I look for in building a business case with organizations are efficiency, effectiveness, and agility in the data points underneath each. Thank you. Any other questions for Michael? So another one that we have is what are the top concerns of the business and how do we put this in the context of cloud security? Uh, and that's going to get back to what I was saying about objectives. I mean, so when you look at objectives in the business, you can have strategic entity level objectives that are that are very high level at the board of directors. You can have division and department level objectives. So, I mean, they could be accounting type objectives, IT objectives, uh, depending on what department HR objectives for a HR cloud computing related stuff. Um, and, and from there, it breaks down into process level objectives. You know, so like a county might have accounts payable objectives or accounts receivable objectives for uh, procurement objectives. Um, and then you might have uh, uh, so process level objectives, then you could have asset level objectives, you know, like protection of uh, EU or California resident information and compliance of GDPR, CCPA, things like that. Um, so you have asset level objectives um, or in other areas of risk, even project level objectives. Uh, and so to me, 
uh, risk management isn't just about the threats and hazards and vulnerabilities and exposures, but it's, it's starting with understanding what are the objectives and then putting that those risks in context of the objectives themselves. Thank you. We are coming up on the end of our time. Uh, so I would like to just take a moment and really thank uh, Michael, who is Michael Rasmussen, who is our keynote speaker. And then also our sponsors, Jamin Hoops from Digital Guardian and Joe Rask Rashke from Seviant. Um, we want to remind people we that... Have a, we have another ahead. meeting. Uh, we have another um, question. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, could you please share your insight on how data sovereignty is affecting international GRC? Oh, I mean, obviously that's a very complicated question. And so I cannot give legal advice so you, <laughs> on that uh, particular piece because of the different legal jurisdictions and things. So I always, you know, you know, catch all, talk to your lawyer on some of that too, you know, your corporate counsel. Um, but, you know, right now, I, I think we're seeing a lot of this challenge right now with data sovereignty, uh, being able be restricting some of our aspects of, of business process and automation and things like that, um, as things just can't flow as freely across boundaries and things anymore. And, and so we need to keep this in light of our overall risk management programs and where data resides and, and the controls that are put in place there. Okay. Thank you, Eric, for submitting that question. There was a second part to it. Do you, do you see a nation state will continue to request expansion of the exp of the inspection surface? Can you say that again? Um, the second part was: Do you see the nation state will continue to request expansion of the inspection surface? Um, I think that's somewhat the trajectory we're on right now as we're seeing a, a, you know, move towards more national identity and things like that. Um, and, and so I, I, right now, I think because of COVID-19 and other things like what you're seeing with Brexit and everything else in the world, where we're seeing a greater focus on national sovereignty again at the moment, which it leads to that trajectory, yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. We are coming up on the, uh, the end of our time, so we're going to close. Uh, before we do, I would like to remind people that we will be sending out a link to the recording of this presentation, full presentation at the beginning of uh, early next week. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us at our email address. Um, There's and, another one that came in too. Um, I, oh, I apologize, wow. Jenny. Um, <laughs> That's great. Uh, again, ultimately, the cloud will be bounded by by these national uh, level regulatory and compliance requirements. Is that? Do you agree uh, with that? I, I would agree with that. Definitely. Yep. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, with that, we're going to close for the day. Thank you so much for your participation. We really appreciate you being a part of this community. Thank you.